Derek, come up. Thank you, Pastor Abe. I sure appreciate that. Thank you so much. I want to thank Pastor Dave for his trust and asking me to share the word with you this morning. I'm so thankful for so many of you just giving encouraging words. And, and we're blessed. Uh, three years we've been a part of you and we grow to love 23 more and more every day. And uh, I am thankful to be able to stand up here. And a little, I'm a little excited, okay? Because I'm going to talk about Jesus this morning. Uh, and when I start talking about Jesus, uh, my Southern Pentecostal spirit comes out. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, I, and, and so please bear with me. If it gets, you know, and, and, uh, and pray for me uh, that, that, God, that God's spirit will be uh, on me. I want to, let's just jump in, okay? Uh, turn with me to Mark, the fifth chapter. We're going to be looking at a, a text here, an event that took place in the life of Jesus Christ. An event that I believe has a very important lesson for us and will teach us some very important things uh, here. So let's, let's uh, mark the fifth chapter. Let's look at verse number 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogues came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. That, so Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. I want to stop just right there uh, this, this morning. I want to speak for just a few minutes this morning from this thought. Bringing Jesus home. Bringing Jesus home. Father, we ask for your word this morning, that it would be alive in this place, Lord God. That your spirit, Lord God, would flow through us and give us hearing ears and receptive hearts, Lord God. You know the needs in this place, Lord God. You know the situations and the circumstances that has walked through those doors. But we know that you're more than enough for them, Lord Jesus. We pray that you touch, that you bless, that you move in a very powerful and a wonderful way in our midst today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. amen. And amen. I met, got married when I was the ripe old age of 27 to a 24-year-old wonderful woman that's working in children's ministries uh, uh, to, today. And when I got married, I walked down the aisle with partially graying hair. And it only got worse from that point. In the, but in three years' time, we had our first child, Hannah, and I kept graying. And in the two more years after that, we had Joel. And by the time they were toddlers, I was this. In, in early 30s, I was solid gray. And many times, I found myself downtown with my two babies, uh, walking around, doing things, and I would receive the strangest compliment. As I walk around, I would, I would, people would run into me and they, in all sincerity, look at me and say, Oh, you have the most precious grandbabies. <laughs> and I, I, I would stand there for a minute and, and then I would I'd have to say, Oh, I'm, 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 I thank you, but they're, they're my babies. They're my children. And with this shocked look on their face, they begin to, they begin to apologize and say, say oh, oh I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I knew what they were really thinking. I hope you live long enough to see these kids grow up. <laughs> and I've done it. I've accomplished it. Just barely, but I've made it. I have enjoyed the ride. I love my kids. And my greatest moments in my life is marked by one thing. I was with them. I have experienced some of the greatest times in my life. But in the last year and a half, I realized that I was going through a transition. A transition that Derek wasn't quite ready for. A transition where I then began to realize that I was no longer raising children. But I was a dad to adults. 
I stood in a Denver uh, uh, government building and watched my son raise his hand and swear into the U.S. Navy and commit six years to be in the property of the U.S. government. Broke my heart. Not because I wasn't proud of him. I was so proud of him. But I knew that there was a point in my life that was passing away. And two weeks ago, I sat on the front row of an outdoor wedding in the mountains of North Carolina. I, I knew it surprised you that I was in Carolina. <laughs> but in the mountains of North Carolina, trying to hold it together. Nobody told me it was going to be this hard. Trying to hold it together while I heard my little girl declare her vows and her love to the man of her dreams. And I realized all of a sudden, I'm like, things have changed I'm no longer dad that barks out orders. No, none of y'all do that. Uh, I, am no longer, I am no longer that individual uh, anymore. And I begin to say, what now? Do I hang up my dad hat? Do I become a spectator in their lives and say, you know, let, let, let's just see how this turns out. What can I do? And I've, and, and, and I've heard, and I've heard, had other men's advice say, oh, just let them go. Just cut the strings. Just, just, just let them go. I'm sorry, but if I can bless my children, I will bless my children. And so I begin to seek God. I begin to pray, and I begin to ask the Lord, Lord, show me what I can do. Show me if there's anything in my life that I can, that I can make a difference in my children's life. And I believe he gave me something. He gave me a spiritual power tool that I never noticed before. A spiritual power tool that was, that was always in my dad's toolbox of tools that, that God gives us. And, and, and I, it's one of the most unused and overlooked in my toolbox, I, I know. And, and I begin to ask the Lord, what is it? And when he showed me, it changed my life. I, 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 for, for, from that point forward, and that was about six months ago, I began to see my role as a dad to adults differently. I began to see my life changed and transformed. That simple power tool is a very simple one, church. It is the power tool called intercession. It's when we as dads decide that we're going to regularly stand before God on behalf of our children. As we as dads are going to stand on behalf of our families. As we as dads are going to stand on behalf of our marriages. And see God work in our lives again. As I begin to, begin to think about this and begin to pray about this. I've come to realize that with that comes a powerful anointing. Because, and I call it the Job anointing. You know, we, we've heard about Job. You know, the one that went through all the trials and, and all the situations. But you know that the, in Job 1, it talks about how he was an upright man. He was a blameless man. He, was, he eschewed evil. And, and God held him in high favor with him. But it doesn't tell us a lot about his practices. It doesn't tell us a lot about what he did before the trials took place. Except for one thing. It tells us about his re relationship with his kids, his adult children. He had 10. And you thought your life was busy. <laughs> he had 10 children, seven adult boys, three adult girls. But the Bible said that he would get up in the mornings and he would go out and he would offer sacrifices for all of his children. Oh, he was a busy man. He had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of responsibility. But Job realized there was one thing that was above everything, that my family be all right. There's one thing above everything in my life that I pray for them. And God so honored it that God put a hedge around them. So much so that the devil, when he come to touch his family, had to get express permission from, G, from, from, the, from God to touch them because this man had prayed a hedge around his family. And as I begin to look at this and I begin to say, well, Lord, please let that anointing be upon us. Please let that anointing be upon our families. Please, Lord God, if there's something I can do to bless them that way, let it be so. And I come to realize that as I looked a little further into it, that there is a purpose for that kind of intercession. And the purpose of that is not just to chat with God about our families. He don't want to see your family pictures. He's, he was there. Yeah. He, he don't want your stories of when they were a baby because he was there. 
That's right. But what he wants to hear is he wants you to invite him into your household. He wants you to invite him into your life. He wants to invite them in to be involved in the very details of everything that they do in their lives. And let me tell you, this morning, Joel is 1,500 miles away in Charleston, South Carolina in the Navy. My daughter is, is the West Coast. I don't know how far away she is. But this morning, I was able to stand there before God and call them before Him and call God's favor upon them and call God's grace upon them and call God's anointing upon them. This dad can still do something. And when I'm a granddad, my grandbabies are going to get the same treatment as I begin to declare His grace over them. But how do we do this, Derek? How do we actually bring Jesus home? That's where Jairus comes in. Here in our text. Jairus was a man that experienced one of the most powerful encounters with Jesus Christ that you could ever imagine. He was a man that experienced one of the greatest miracles that, you, that we've seen in the entire Gospels. He was a man that was a very powerful man. But here was a man that gives us far more than just a story. He gives us a road map. Good news, guys. We don't need to ask directions. He's already handled it for us. Here, notice, notice about Jairus. I like this man, Jairus. I love this man, Jairus. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about him. He told us that he was a that he was a ruler of the synagogue. It told us that he uh, that and, and because of that, we understand he was probably a very wealthy man. That he was probably a Pharisee. Ooh. That, that he was probably that he was probably a man of very high regard and high respect. But you know, I, it, none of those things really impressed me. But what impressed me was that none of that really mattered to Jairus now. Because right now, in the middle of his situation, with a 12-year-old daughter that was at home dying, he didn't want to be anything more than dad. He didn't care about his job. He didn't care about his position. He didn't care about any of those things. And fathers, I'm here to talk to you dad to dad and tell you there is no job in your life that is more important than those babies in your life. There is no role or responsibility in your world that holds a greater potential for eternal ramifications, that has a greater potential for leaving your legacy for generations to generations to come. I want to take and follow J. Iris and learn how to bring Jesus home. See, first thing that J. Iris teaches us is that a seeking dad brings Jesus home. It may seem like that it's not a big deal or a big detail in the story of Jairus, but I believe it's a vital one. Jairus found Jesus himself. I'm glad he didn't send mama. I'm glad he didn't send a servant. I'm glad he didn't send a note. When you get a chance, Jesus, would you please drop by my house? I'd like to see you for, for a while. I'm glad he didn't do any of those things. J. Iris understood that what he needed to do, only he could do. He realized that as a dad, he needed to reach Jesus himself. I'm, I want you to know this morning, child of God, that nobody can bring to you what Jesus can bring to your life. And only you can discover that. And as dads, we need to take the responsibility and to say, Lord Jesus, I need to find you for myself. Because our families deserve more than a dad that has a secondhand knowledge of Jesus. A Sunday morning knowledge of Jesus. Our families need dads that walk with him, that talk with him, that know how to reach him when everything is falling apart. The way need that he, we need that kind of dad. You know, and if I keep aging as rapidly as I'm aging, one day I'm going to slip from this world. And maybe you don't think this way, but I think, what is the conversation around my deathbed going to be? <laughs> I don't want my kids talking about my favorite dessert. I don't want my kids talking about my talents or my gifts or what I have or what I possess. I want to I want to take everything away anyway so that they don't have anything to fight over when it comes. But I want these words to be said of me. If ever a man knew Jesus, daddy Knew Jesus. 
And Lord willing, a grandchild would be there. I wish they would say, you know, when I run into this problem and that problem, all I had to do is come to granddaddy and tell him. And I knew, I knew everything was going to be all right because I knew that he would talk to Jesus on a regular basis. I knew he stood in the gap for me and for my family in my life. Church, men, we need to know God for ourselves because of our family's sake. We need to be that Jairus that finds him in the middle of our need, in the middle of our situation. And I like where Jairus found Jesus. I'm not talking about a geographic location. Jairus found Jesus. I love this. When Jairus came to the end of Jairus. The most powerful prayer in your life is a desperate prayer. It's that prayer when you don't have, you can't, you can't even rely on yourself anymore. You can't even rely on anybody else anymore. But you know you've got to reach Jesus. Jairus was a, was a Pharisee who was not allowed to bow before anything. But he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. Why did he throw himself at the feet of Jesus? Because he had no other recourse but Jesus. He had no other answers but Jesus. Oh men, one of the best prayers you can ever pray is I can't Lord, but you can Lord. Lord, I'm not fit. Fit to do what you've called me to do. But Lord God, you are more than enough for my needs and my situation. Oh, he gives us a promise men. If, if you, sh you shall seek me, and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. Let's be seeking dads. Oh, seeking God and seeking what he has for our lives. Also, he points out to us that we need to be believing dads. Now, I want you to realize that I didn't say a dad that believed. How many of you like instant miracles? Only me? Uh, I like, I like faith like that. Boom, boom, boom. God, I'm going to ask for it. Give it to me right now. Boom. How many of you receive those on a regular basis? Oh, praise God. Praise God. Instant miracles is generally not the way God deals with me. And Jesus didn't deal with Jairus that way. Jesus kept a secret from this man. What was the secret? I could speak the word and she would be healed. I could do like I did for centurion servant. And you don't have to worry about it. But you see, when we bring our needs to Jesus, I've learned something about Jesus. He sees our need uh, as, as not just one need, but many needs. He knows all the needs of your life. And when he touches us and he moves on us, he touches multiple needs. You see, he understood that Jairus not only needed healing for his daughter, and not only needed Jesus in his home, but that Jairus needed to walk his faith a while. That J Jairus needed to have a believing faith that was continuous. A believing faith that would, that, would act, that would be there when things are good and there when things are bad. Would be there when things are up and there when things are down. You see, here, here was Jairus in the middle of, of, the, of the mass crowd. Jesus had gotten up from where he was at. He had taken to the streets. And all of a sudden, boom, the multitudes. And they begin to move. And Jairus learned that first of all, you've got to believe when there's delays in your life. Because he's walking down the street with all these people and he's going through mental torment. Can you imagine? You've just left your 12-year-old girl laying in bed, dying. And you're, you're walking, watching the clock and you're beginning to say, Lord, it's, time is running out. We need you, Lord Jesus. And then the unthinkable happens. The crowd stops. Jesus turns and faces the other direction. Wait, Lord Jesus, I don't know that, that way. That way. That's my need. He, and he said, somebody has touched me. And it was the woman with the issue of blood. Now, it, to, for all of us, it's a beautiful picture. It's to, for, 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 for this man, uh, Jairus, it was not a good thing. It was a delay. But that day, Jairus would learn something. That when you walk with Jesus, delay is not denial. When you walk with Jesus, sometimes he just puts you on hold for a while and lets you believe through the darkness and believe through the night. But if you just keep believing Jesus Christ, you will receive what he has for you. Now, I want you to know this morning that I, what I'm talking about is not the, uh, theoretical. What I'm talking about is just not, not some concept. Since January, 
I began to commit myself to interceding on behalf of my, my family and my children. And the longer I prayed, the more nothing happened. Some of you have been there. <laughs> the more I said, Lord God, I, I need this, I need that, the, the more. And, and then I remember one especially dark week. I was praying and, and I, could, I couldn't feel anything. I was praying and it was, it was not going anywhere. And I kept hearing somebody whisper in my voice, you're wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. Why are you bothering doing this at all? You could do a lot better things. You could even be spending time with those family members that you're praying for. Why don't you just, why don't you just put this aside, this foolishness aside. God doesn't require this. Just go on with your life. But I begin to press through and I begin to say, no, no, I believe in prayer. And I've learned something about prayer. If you believe in it, you'll do it. If you don't, you won't. It's as, it's as, simple, it's as simple as that. But I begin to push through and begin to pray. And I was sitting at work about a week later. And I got a text from my daughter. And it, and, and it started like this. It said, Daddy, can I ask you a personal question? Believe me, there's no dad that wants to hear that from their 20-something-year-old daughter. <laughs> I was like, personal questions are for your mom. Oh, I, didn't, that, that, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I said, I said sure, go ahead and mash that button and grimaced. <laughs> she said, in your prayer time, do you pray for me? I hadn't told her a thing. I hadn't told her that they were target one <laughs> in my life. And I said, uh, I pray for you. I pray for your husband to come, James. And because God is eternal, I pray for my grandbabies. He already knows their name. He knows where they're at. And by the time they come into this world, they're going to have be covered in prayer because of granddaddy. <laughs> she said, well, what exactly do you pray for me about? Kids want to know everything. <laughs> and I said, I said, I pray that God's hand is upon you. That God will walk with you. That he would be revealed in your life. That, that he would build a relationship that the enemy cannot defeat and destroy. That he'll build a relationship where others can see him in you. And she said, oh. Well, that explains it. And then just left it like that. I'm like, you got to tell me more than that, girl. <laughs> she said, well, Daddy, I've experienced God in church, church camps. She said, but let me tell you, it's been rare. But this week, every day, he shows up. <laughs> This week, he talks to me. This week, he walks with me. This week, he reveals himself to me. I said, it's pretty good, isn't it? She said, it is great, Daddy. And this old dad sat at his desk and just cried like a big baby. She don't know it, but she better get used to it. Because Daddy's not stopping. Yes. Yes. Men, we need that, that testimony in our life. What would our children's life be like if we stood before God day by day and said, Lord God, I know where they're at. But Lord God, you know where they're really at, Lord Jesus. As we stood before them every day and we begin to cry out for God on their behalf, then I believe we can see God move in a very powerful way. Amen. But also, we need to have faith when everything Goes too far. He's standing there and he's listening to Jesus tell this woman with the issue of blood, daughter. And I think it cut through him when he said daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go. And he turned around and he turned around and he, and he, uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he was trying to, to compose himself when all of a sudden he realizes that the people from his house had shown up. And they said something that cut him to the chase. They said, Ma don't, your daughter's died. No need to, ma to bother the master anymore. But before that word could hit the ground, Jesus had spun 
and looked him straight in the eyes and said, do not be afraid, just believe. You know, there's times in our lives when things look too far gone. But when we've been walking with Jesus, we're crazy enough to believe that he still can. When we're walking with Jesus, we're crazy enough to believe that Jesus is the Lord that specializes in too far gone. He specializes that in our life. Because this man was about to realize something that, that Mary and Martha had already discovered. He, he needed to realize that Jesus was not just the life, but he was the resurrection and the life. What does that mean? That means not only did he speak life, but he can speak life out of death. Amen. That thing that has gone too far. That thing that, is, that has gone beyond the conceivable. God can speak, bring it forth. I'm here to tell some dad this morning. That son, somebody told, is too far gone. Jesus said, don't be afraid, just keep believing. That daughter that you've thrown up your hands and said, I, I've done all that I can do. Well, good, you're at a good starting point. <laughs> when you've done everything that you can do, now it's time to do like Jay Iris and throw it on God. When you truly believe, when nobody else is believing, and when they come to you and say, oh, you don't need to believe that, say, wait a minute, I've been walking with this guy. And the longer I walk with this guy, the more I realize he's not just a teacher. He's not just a healer. That he is the very son of God and nothing is impossible with him. But J. Iris shows us finally that it takes a surrendered dad to bring Jesus home. I noticed something as Jesus approached the house of J. Iris. I, it reminded me of another time that somebody invited Jesus into, into their home by the name of Simon Peter. And I noticed a certain pattern that I saw when people invite Jesus into to your home. And let me warn you guys, when you start inviting Jesus into your home, he doesn't come in as a guest. He doesn't come in to visit. He doesn't come in for a spot of tea. When Jesus steps into your house, he always comes in as Lord. He always comes in as King. I noticed that in Simon Peter's situation and also in Jairus' situation that when Jesus walked through the door, he took charge. He began to command things and he began to place things in order the way they should be. Why? Because where the king is, so is the kingdom of God. All his authority, all his power. Let me tell you, when you invite Jesus in, you're inviting the kingdom into your house. You're inviting the kingdom into your life. He walks into Simon Peter's house. And Simon Peter, and, uh, I believe he said, Lord, you have to excuse my mother-in-law. She's, she's got a fever. Oh, no, no problem. He walks into the bedroom and he reaches down and he grabs her by the hand and he lifts her up. <laughs> he puts things in order. I see it here in J. Iris's house. He gets to the house and I like the word, there was a tumult. There was a crazy party going on because he was a wealthy man there was plenty of professional mourners. But he comes in and he says something crazy. Have you ever had God tell you something crazy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he comes in and he says, she's not dead. She's asleep. And they start mocking him and scoring him. And then I like what they said next. When Jesus had put them out. <laughs> he didn't look at the owners of the house and say, you need to get these guys out of here. He didn't look at the disciples and say, take care of it. No, Jesus took care of himself. The king was in the house. He, oh, let me tell you, when he comes into your house, there's some voices that he's going to silence. When he comes into your house, there's some attitudes that he's going to expel. When he comes into your house, there's some spirits that he's going to put an end to. He's going to serve some eviction notices uh, in, in that place because where Jesus is looking, Lord, nothing else can be Lord. But as I looked at this, I said, Lord Jesus, this man had to surrender to you being Lord. But he had to surrender his family to Jesus. It was a radical shift from the time when Jesus shut through everybody out. Not a good way to make friends, by the way threw everybody out, and then he stepped into that house. It was as if a different person stepped into that room. Why? Because now 
He was a member of that household. He didn't run up to the little girl and, 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 and declare her to arise and, 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 and get loud and get, get boisterous. No. But he looked over the mom whose eyes were swollen from crying over her little girl. And her dad, whose lips were trembling, seeing her laid out, washed and prepared for burial. And he took them over to the side of her. And then Jesus does something unique. He walks over and he just takes her little hand. And then he says, Talitha Kumai. Which I, I asked the question, why, why in all the scriptures did, did it not translate this? And, and, and I come to realize something. That was Aramaic. That was the house language. On the street, you spoke Greek. On the street, you, you, you spoke the, But they in their homes spoke Aramaic. So when Jesus was talking to this little girl, he was talking to her like a brother would talk to a sister. He was talking to her like a father would talk to a daughter. And I can just imagine on the other side what happened. That little girl heard a familiar sound. Talitha Kuma. It sounded familiar, but oh, it thundered through the darkness. <laughs> and, all, and all of a sudden, she felt, she felt the gentle touch of a warm hand. Upon, and when she opened her eyes, she saw love like she had never seen it before. Dads, when you give your children to Jesus, when you give their situations and their circumstances, no one will love them like he loves them. No one will care for him like he cares for them. I believe that little girl grew up. I believe she'd become a mom, a wife, a grandma. But you know what I believe her favorite story was? You got it. And I believe it all started with this phrase. I'll never forget the day Daddy brought Jesus home. My heart's desire for you this morning is that your family would say the same thing. It's to say, oh, Jesus has changed my life because of Daddy. Jesus has changed my life because of what He has done in my life. This morning, I want to I want to give you an opportunity, dads, to say, "Lord, let that be me." Lord, I I understand and I I I see the responsibility in my life, and I want nothing more than to be Jesus to my family, to let them see Jesus in me. Would you stand with us?